Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to this Hidden Gems webinar series. Now, this will be the last for a couple of weeks. We'll be taking a break next week, given the public holiday on Thursday. And in uh, typical Australian fashion, it looks like everyone will be taking the long weekend ahead of the AFL grand final and a public holiday in Western Australia on Monday. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Now, also watch out for our morning market video. It's more the details behind the markets, uh, the numbers we focus on. And we reckon we're days ahead of the AFR when it comes to picking up emerging investment themes and uh, news in particular. Uh, don't forget to ask questions of the CEOs, type them in the box provided, and we'll make a start right now. First up, we've got Index, ASX code IMD, market cap of 817 million. We've got with us Paul House, who was the CEO. If you don't know the company, the company is a leading global mining technology company that enables drilling contractors and resource companies to safely find, define and mine all bodies with precision and at speed. Paul, thanks for your time. Over to you. Thanks, Tim. Well, we might roll straight onto the next slide, if you don't mind, and, um, and uh, maybe one more, and we'll talk about Index. Uh, as you point out, it's a global mining tech company. Uh, we do make a distinction between mining tech and mining services. Uh, Australia has a very big portfolio of mining services companies. And as a mining tech company, we distinguish ourselves uh, to the extent that we tend to be capital light compared to a lot of mining services companies, people light compared to mining services companies. Uh, we are global. Only about 20% of our revenue comes from Australia. And we're commodity agnostic and we have a, a reach into about 70% of the world's mining activity. So we tend to find that we don't have a lot of contract risk either. And all of those features, I think, are attractive elements of our business model and separate us from the way that uh, a lot of people evaluate mining services as a space. Um, and it's obviously an attractive space to be in. Uh, moving to the next slide, uh, we just reported our FY22 financial highlights. Uh, and for us, you know, a number of key themes, obviously record revenue, record EBITDA, record NPAT, and a record dividend were all highlights. Uh, but probably the key feature for us is on the bottom left of the screen, the uh, EBITDA margin at 31%. <clears throat> this is the third consecutive year of EBITDA margin expansion that we've achieved. But there's really a, a hidden element inside of that number that we are particularly attracted to, and that is... Uh, obviously, there is good operating leverage in the business model. It is a key feature of the business model. It's a good quality business model in that as that record revenue or as each dollar of revenue comes in, we get very good leverage into the EBITDA uh, line. Um, the incremental margin that you can see with 29% record revenue and 39% record EBITDA highlights some of that. But in addition to that, during the year, we've absorbed uh, a significant amount of costs that are looking to stand up uh, a new business unit as we move into the mining production phase and as we execute our digital 2.0 strategy. And so we expense those costs as we stand up those programs uh, and that EBITDA margin and that EBITDA margin percentage would be better in terms of evaluating the core operating business itself. Uh, if you roll forward to the next slide, uh, you can see that our five-year compound annual growth rate in revenue at 14%, we set ourselves a very clear bar at ensuring that we grow above the market rate. Uh, and the market proxy we use is the S&P Global Exploration Expenditure, which over the last five years at 9% sits below our five-year CAGR of 14%. Uh, and again, looking to the right on the slide in front of you, you can see the, the benefits of that uh, operating leverage in our business model coming through in our five-year EBITDA CAGR and that progression in our EBITDA margin, uh, which have been very strong features. And we expect those features to continue as we look through FY23 and beyond. Uh, moving to the next slide. Uh, that growth profile, uh, I made a point at the beginning that we are a truly global uh, mining tech business. Uh, we've seen very strong growth in the Americas, uh, Canada, uh, USA, both. Uh, and then strong amount of investment is starting to flow into South America at the moment, which during COVID was probably a little slower to recover than some other regions, uh, as was Africa. And we're now starting as we enter FY23 to see significant exploration money start to head into that African region as well. 
Uh, the APAC region has been very good for us. It experienced very strong growth coming uh, out of that initial COVID bounce. Uh, rig utilization in that area is pretty high, but we're seeing all of the drillers increase their rig fleets and we're seeing all of the resource companies increase their budgets. And so that strong growth we saw in FY22, we expect will continue to be, uh, will have growth as we move into FY23. Uh, rolling forward to operating highlights. No good financial highlights occur without uh, some good uh, operational fundamentals underneath it. Uh, from reading across the top of the slide here, obviously focusing on our people and we've identified our health and safety improvements in the form of LTFIRR, but we also focus very heavily on uh, employee engagement, both HSE engagement and overall wellness uh, engagement of our workforce. And for that overall employee engagement, we, we use Gallup as a firm to come and measure our improvement. I think the highlight here is that over the last two years, Gallup has reported uh, employee disengagement has been rapidly growing in workforces around the world. Uh, and some of you will have heard of that in the form of the great resignation and the like. Uh, whereas at Index, we have gone against that trend and we've seen heightened employee engagement across all countries and all facets of our business, which is pleasing. Uh, moving along, obviously we place strong emphasis on our ESG, both the footprint that we cover as a business, plus our ability to help other organizations. Uh, and the third party agency, Sustainalytics, completed a review for us and have rated us low uh, from an ESG rating perspective. Those are very important features of our business. Really though, on the bottom left, the real heroes of our business for the year were the supply chain team who kept everything uh, moving uh, under significant duress. And we're seeing really great results from that group. We would not have had 29% revenue growth were it not for that team. Uh, moving forward onto R&D, onto the next slide. Um, we do expense about $30 million a year in research and development. A small amount is capitalized, but the majority is expensed, which is a very conservative position that we take uh, in, in how we manage our earnings. Uh, and what we seek to do is make sure that our shareholders understand that we deploy that R&D effort across a number of horizons. Horizon one is, uh, protecting our core business and ensuring we have the next generation of products coming through. Whereas Horizon 3, on the other hand, is how we invest today for products that might unlock material revenue for the business in three to five years' time. Uh, you can see that in FY22, we had a significant growth in Horizon 3 as we brought our Blast Dog project through to commercial prototype. And as you go into FY23 and beyond, you'll see that number reduce and you'll see the growth in horizon one and horizon two. Uh, moving forward, a very strong balance sheet. Uh, we, uh, the fact that we expense our R&D makes for a conservative balance sheet and we always maintain a net cash position. We do that because of our exposure to the expiration cycles. Uh, but pleasingly, obviously a very strong return on equity and return on capital employed uh, once again, a key feature that is attractive about a mining technology company as distinct from a mining services company. Uh, and we've continued to invest throughout the cycle in, in new technologies. And if we keep moving forward, please. The outlook for our industry remains pretty strong. We see uh, very strong commitments from drilling companies to increase their uh, rig fleets. Most of them have order books that are typically three or four months forward visibility, but today they have nine and 10 months forward visibility. And that's a level of confidence that that industry hasn't seen for some time. And most of the major producers and tier one resource companies have all announced increases in exploration budgets. Again, those are the fundamental drivers that underpin our business. Uh, there is some uncertainty about junior and intermediate financings out of the TSX. But I think that's counterbalanced by some of the commitments you're seeing from the majors, which account for far and away the largest number of, or the amount spent in this space. Moving forward, um, our bulk of our revenue today comes from our core business in the bottom left of this strategy quadrant. But we've made a very clear statement about how we are building our solution selling in that area. Uh, the R&D and the acquisitions that we make address the two boxes to the top of that quadrant. And really excitingly, it's our expansion from exploration into mining production that is really driving our strategy delivery today. 
And we'll roll on to the next slide and I can elaborate on that a little bit more. Our extension into mining production on the next slide uh, seeks to highlight some of the progress we've made in building products uh, to go into this space. We have very strong core capabilities in fluids and sensing tools. It is the same technology, it is the same ore body, it is the same asset owner in the production phase as it is in the exploration phase. So what we are doing is just tailoring our products to ensure they suit the workflow in that production phase. And we saw significant progress with the blast old contract uh, that we announced in uh, August of this year, the first commercial contract of its kind. And the economics of that business are very attractive. Uh, if we could move forward to the next slide, please. Uh, the benefits of the index mining technologies focus around ore body knowledge. What we seek to do is to ensure that we help resource companies understand the ore body to the maximum extent possible, and that impacts every downstream activity thereafter. Uh, and the ability to give that information should make for a much more efficient mining industry and unlock precision mining opportunities and tier two deposits that have previously been inaccessible. Rolling forward, uh, our outlook for our focus for FY23 is about continuing the development of that mining production solution and our, the software that supports it, uh, prosecuting our digital 2.0 program, which focuses on optimizing our cost base uh, and always protecting our people. And uh, moving to the last slide, our outlook uh, as we've started FY23 has been strong. Uh, our revenue growth in July was above June, and we've seen strong growth again as we are looking to round out Q1 this year. Uh, and the underlying fundamentals for our industry have never been stronger. Uh, and I'll probably leave it there, Tim, and hand over to you for some Q&A. Bang on time. Thank you, Paul. There's quite a few questions coming through. One is, um, what do you think is kind of reasonable expectations for medium-term earnings growth? And, and what's your kind of main macro risk? Right, so we don't give guidance about earnings growth, but what I will say is we use that S&P proxy um, in terms of exploration expenditure growth, which is a published number. And because of the investment we make in R&D and the capability we have, we always look to grow above that number. Uh, and that's within our core business. Add to that the growth potential that comes as we extend our offering into production. And we're looking obviously for um, some strong top line growth uh, and as we send up that new business unit, whilst there'll be some cost to stand that up in the beginning, the economics of that business unit will be as strong as our core business. And Paul, there's, there's a question here on your Blast Dog uh, rollout um, post the commercial prototype phase. Can you give us some sort of um, expectations around winning market share over the next three to five years? Yeah, we're looking to, the way we take that product to market is to work with resource companies to understand first and foremost each ore body and the unique challenges that that ore body may have. Uh, we then aim to conduct a trial where the definition of success for them and for us is determined at the outset. Uh, we're learning as much about our product as they are about their ore body during that trial phase. And at the conclusion of that, we're obviously looking to see whether we can better inform them about their ore body than they can uh, without Blast Dog, uh, and then convert trials into commercial contracts. Uh, we're testing that in, uh, the way we're testing that at the moment is in bulk commodities and in copper. Uh, we have trials in those commodities uh, underway as we speak. Uh, and we'll look to roll that out in the Americas and Australia first and foremost. After that, we'll then look to lithium, nickel, gold, uh, and we'll look to other geographies. And, and you talk about the, you spoke about the supply chain. What are some of the, what's the outlook there? And, and can you talk through some of the labour pressures you may be seeing? Yeah, look, the supply chain, I think, has been uh, strung like a piano wire probably for two years. Uh, pleasingly, we are seeing uh, signs that those supply chain pressures have been, uh, uh, have been improving for us, whereas we used to have most of our product on the water on, on the way to its destination. It's now in the warehouse ready to be drawn down by our clients. Uh, I do think that they're probably susceptible to a little bit of risk if there is further disruption, but right now they're in a good space. I do think labour will remain a challenge for the industry at large. And although Index is labour light, um, our clients uh, do have a labour challenge, uh, attracting them to the industry, keeping them in the industry. And then once they're there, keeping them safe, uh, recognising, of course, that uh, when people are unwell, whether it's COVID or other reasons, um, non-attendance or absenteeism at workplaces is, is higher now than before COVID. 
And unfortunately, drilling is not a working from home activity, Tim. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, and now talk about the critical miner- minerals industries. How do you work with these kind of new industries, if you like, you know, rare earths, there seems to be a rare earth discovery all the time. What, what sort of d- demand do you see and how does that impact index? Yeah, look, uh, it is by far and away one of the most exciting and fastest growing areas. And it's not just lip service. You're seeing actual activity on the ground. Uh, historically, copper, cobalt, nickel and lithium would have accounted for 35% of exploration spend. Uh, but what we see today is that new projects across those critical metals commodities across that bucket is closer to 65%. Uh, and over time, you'll start to see the weight of that on total S&P expiration spend. Uh, the reason for that is whether it's consumer behaviour, uh, automotive supply chains, government policy, or the policies of the finance sector about who they lend to and who they invest in, every element of every element is now placed very clear policies and pricing around how they will support industries that are driving towards sustainable outcomes. Uh, And hence that demand for critical metals, I think is gonna be one of the greatest opportunities uh, facing our sector for many years to come. And and just finally, Paul, um, can you talk about M&A strategy and um, how you you go about acquiring new, new verticals, new products versus creating those products internally? Yeah, we always have a choice. So we we talk about the ABCs of growth being acquire, build and collaborate. Um, whenever we do have a strong R&D capability. And so whenever we look at an acquisition, we also thoroughly prosecute the idea of building out a solution ourselves. Uh, specifically around acquisition, uh, we look at smaller emerging technologies and the opportunity to, uh, if they're on strategy and if the culture is a fit, to bring them into our suite of offerings Uh, leverage our global network, which is probably one of our strongest and most unvalued assets, is the ability to take products to market. Um, And we obviously have the balance sheet capability to look at larger acquisitions should they present, but we are very disciplined around how we undertake valuations uh, and how we actually, uh, how critical we are about strategic fit and cultural fit before we embark on, on any acquisition. Paul, that's all we have time for. Really find uh, Index a fascinating story. Have a nice weekend. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Appreciate the chance. Okay, next up we have Tilau Energy, market co, uh, ASX ticker, TOU, market cap of around $18 million. We have with us Tony Gilby, who's the Managing Director and CEO. The company is developing cleaner power solutions for Botswana through gas-fired power, solar power and hydrogen. Tony, thanks for your time. Over to you. Thank you very much, Tim, and the uh, following presentation, the presentation that I'll be giving will be all about gas to power generation in Botswana with a a few add-ons as well. Next slide, please. And next. So Talao Energy, uh, we've been developing and delineating a very large gas field in Botswana for many years now. And uh, of course, getting uh, the approvals process all completed takes a long time uh, anywhere, but uh, Africa is no exception. And we're at the stage now where we've gotten uh, all key uh, approvals achieved to uh, not only uh, continue to drill out the field, uh, develop the the development wells, uh, collect the gas, put it into a power station and uh, and uh, turn it to electricity. Um, that has culminated in a, a 10, an initial 10 megawatt power purchase agreement with a Botswana Power Corporation. The government owned a power utility there. Uh, we are the first ones to actually get a, an independent power project up with a Botswana Power Corp. And uh, we view that as a, a major achievement. And the next step of the project is really to convert our gas to electricity and to to deliver into that uh, contract. Next slide, please. So our process flow, uh, the primary objective is to uh, convert our our gas into electricity and sell it into the existing grid at a nearby town uh, called Saroe. And with that objective, we're currently building a uh, transmission line, which is fully funded by our largest shareholder being the Botswana Public Officers Pension Fund, a local pension fund 
also the largest investor in Botswana. We have add-ons of uh, solar because it makes sense in the uh, Botswana region that we're based. It has a very high solar incidence and works perfectly with a gas-fired power to, to deliver ultimately 24-7 a cleaner energy into the grid. We also have a, a prototype developing for a, a plasma pyrolysis unit, and that will take our gas directly, our methane gas, and split it off into uh, hydrogen and solid carbon. Next slide, please. Our company is uh, triple listed. We started out on the Australian Stock Exchange, migrated to London when resources weren't that in vogue here a, a number of years back. And we're about 50-50 between those two exchanges, uh, the UK and Australia. And we're also on the Botswana Stock Exchange because that allowed investment by local uh, institutions and culminated in the pension fund taking a significant stake in us. About 600 million shares on issue. Thank you. Our board, uh, extensive experience myself, I've been the founder of a number of public companies, always starting them from the, from the grassroots, from, from uh, uh, vacant acreage, uh, and then developing the resource up to the point of sale. And that is the objective, and that's where we're progressing with Talao Energy as well. Next slide. We clearly have a, uh, an experience, a field operations team as well, uh, largely based in Botswana. We own our project 100%. We drill all our own wells and we like to have full control of uh, drilling our wells because that helps us keep in control of the costs as well. And that picture is, uh, is our field base in the edge of, on the edge of the Kalahari Desert, showing some of our equipment uh, that we use in our drilling operation. Next slide. So the actual location, the map shows where we're based. We are to the north of the capital city of Haberoni and essentially in the middle of Botswana. It's actually quite easy to get to though, only about three hours drive from the capital city. The capital city's less than an hour from Joburg to fly. The country has an extensive and modern electricity grid and we're looking at joining that grid with a transmission line in the dotted purple on that map. The objective is to get into the grid at Sarawi, and then the initial power contract will be with Botswana Power Corporation. And then we can expand, all else being equal, up to the Arapa Diamond Mine. The Arapa Diamond Mine, the largest diamond mine in the world, uh, produces several billion dollars of diamonds a year, and it goes through about 90 megawatts uh, of diesel a year. So uh, that's a, a very big opportunity to convert that diesel to our gas uh, with time. Next slide. So it's all about addressing the power deficits in the region with newer sources of cleaner energy. And that's our focus, uh, Tim. And uh, our energy will indeed displace the uh, very uh, carbon intensive coal fire power station. There's a picture of the main one there with the two smokestacks, it'll assist in uh, displacing and replacing that ultimately, and also displacing the billion odd US dollars of diesel that is burnt in the country, uh, just in Botswana to keep the lights on every year. Next slide. So our Lacetti Gas of Power project is our flagship project. We have all approvals in place, including a generation license and an initial power purchase agreement with Botswana Power Corporation. The ongoing exercise, uh, the operation in the field right as we speak is to, uh, is building the grid connection by the transmission line from La City, the approximate 100 kilometers to the nearby town of Sarawi. And that is progressing uh, and is more or less on track for completion at the middle of next year. And that keeps us on track for the objective of first revenue towards the end of next year. We have a planned drilling program to delineate and flow more gas as we're building up to that uh, grid connection and being able to commercialise, effectively commercialise any new gas flow rather than simply flaring it, which we're currently doing. Next slide. We extract our gas by simple horizontal or lateral drilling techniques. 
on the on the left there and on the right we are developing our first power plant in a modular design uh, starting out in one megawatt units and that is to reduce risk and capex as we grow in this very important phase of our development next slide we have independently certified gas reserves next slide the aforementioned Soroe uh, substation on the left where we'll be adjoining into the existing a power grid and on the right it gives you an idea of what the countryside's like where we're currently drilling and flaring gas. Next slide. The objective is to mix some solar in with our gas fired power because gas is an ideal fuel to support renewables, particularly solar, and thereby we can make a 24 seven cleaner product than would otherwise be the case. And we have a solar generation license in place, which is uh, a, uh, uh, and it, uh, uh, something that is an achievement as well in Botswana, given the, the uh, approvals regime that we all have to work under. It's very uh, cumbersome to say the least, but we've achieved that as well. Next slide. We have a, a, a prototype being built in Brisbane with our hydrogen partners, Synergen Met. Now, the unique aspect of this hydrogen uh, project is they've already done it in, a, uh, in a, an initial prototype in Brisbane. Now we're converting that technology to take our gas, our CH4, and directly split it to hydrogen and solid carbon. The hydrogen will be initially fed back into our power plant, and then will ultimately be used for cleaner fuel, uh, assuming the, uh, the prototype all goes according to plan, and that's why one builds a prototype, of course, in the solid carbon, there is a market for that in South Africa that we've currently uh, already uh, delineated. Next slide. We support a number of uh, local community initiatives, and that's part of uh, our, our approach in Botswana to be a part of the local community and to support wherever we can. Next slide. So in summary, we're developing the Lissetti gas to power project. Gas is now good again. Gas is a, an excellent fuel to deliver instant power, to deliver uh, uh, air conditioning or heat, depending on uh, what's required as far as temperature amelioration. We have a couple of other projects as well, which are developing in the background, not as high a priority as a gas to power, of course, and that's our solar and hydrogen solid carbon projects. We have extensive approvals in place and a very supportive uh, local community and government as we're moving to get this project into first revenue. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Bang on time. Um, fascinating story, actually. Now, now, Botswana has been heavily reliant on South Africa for its energy um, previously. So how do you see that kind of South African instability playing into, into your hands? Oh, thank you, Tim. Yes, indeed. Uh, South Africa is, is very uh, insecure in its power supply at the moment, and most uh, third-party evaluations suggest that it's just on the brink of collapse, and it is a, a, a major need for both internally within their country and the surrounding countries to develop more power projects. Now, coal is still uh, not in vogue as opposed to gas. A gas, of course, can produce... Uh, not only base load, but peaking power, we can turn it on and off. So it's a, it's a beautiful fuel to have available for energy generation. And ultimately, once we've satisfied the Botswana power needs, we would uh, love to be able to export into neighbouring countries, including uh, South Africa, and all that's doable via the Southern African Power Pool and all the countries in the Southern African Power Pool, a region of some 500 uh, billion people, uh, 500 million people rather, uh, they're all connected by the Southern African Power Pool. And, and what's the political environment like in Botswana? I mean, you've got uh, an aligned shareholder there. Is there any risk in that? I'm sure you get asked that question. Um, there's, there's, uh, and, and what, what do you mean by that, Tim? Sorry. Oh, just what's the, what's the political environment like there uh, currently? I, you know, we don't know a lot about it. So can you give us some more colour there? Well, certainly, certainly. Uh, Botswana is a very stable democracy. It's been independent uh, since the mid '60s, it's a former protectorate of of the uh, of England, of uh, of Britain, 
and therefore it has inherited all English laws and regulations and a Westminster style of parliament. So there's been uh, free and fair elections from day one and always a smooth uh, transition of power. Uh, the government and the people of Botswana have been very lucky in having the diamonds to, uh, to develop and to help fund infrastructure, et cetera, but they won't last forever. And they are seeking very supportive of new uh, industries, including mining and gas development to assist the country to grow and to prosper. Thanks, Tony. And, and there's a question here, what, what is the potential to increase your flow rates and what's the plan to do that? Uh, yes, indeed. We're, uh, we've learned a lot of lessons as we've developed our field at Lissetti over the years. And what we've found is that with additional uh, lateral wells, we should be able to increase the flow rate. And just recently, with all of our geotechnical evaluation over the previous period, we've determined that there's only a fraction of the well bore probably open to, uh, to flowing at the moment. So if we uh, tweak and modify our new wells such that uh, we're getting a, a significant amount uh, more of that well bore open and flowing, that our gas flow rate should uh, commensurately increase. And with all of these sorts of projects, the flow rate uh, goes straight to your bottom line. So that will be the objective uh, early next year when we get drilling again to, uh, to uh, increase the flow rate and to get more gas flowing. And that should flow straight to the, the ultimate bottom line, Tim. And, and Tony, just finally, what, what sort of capex are we talking? And, and can you give us uh, some guidelines around uh, time timeframes? Well, for the transmission line, it's about uh, $5 million to connect to the grid, plus there's some ancillary uh, equipment and costs that go with that. Uh, the thing about our drilling, we can drill wells cheaper than uh, I've been involved with in Australia. The Australian costs, and we still we have colleagues over here in Australia drilling wells in Queensland. We're using a similar technique. The Queensland wells are somewhere between three and five times the cost of, of an equivalent well in Botswana. And uh, effectively, that means we can get a, a full uh, development pod comprising a vertical well and two lateral wells uh, down for uh, about one and a half million dollars. So that's that's a, a very, very good price. And the more we drill, the uh, the more efficient we're getting at it. Tony, that's all we have time for. Thank you for your time. Have a nice weekend. Thank you, Tim. Next up, we have Q Energy. We're still on the energy discussion. ASX code uh, CUE, market cap around $50 billion. We have with us Matthew Boyle, who's the CEO. The company is an oil and gas production and exploration company with a diversified mix of gas and oil pr production access in Australia, Indonesia, and New Zealand. Thanks for your time. Over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Tim, and good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone listening. Today, I'd like to take you through Q Energy and a simple story of a scale change in FY22 and continued growth from oil and gas production in FY23. You can move on, please. Please take time to read the important notices. As mentioned by Tim, Q Energy is an oil and gas production company. Uh, we have revenue from four geographical areas in New Zealand, Australia, and Indonesia. And in FY22, we went through a significant scale change, which doubled our revenue and is now the baseline for our future company. We generate strong cash, which we'll show through our results. And we have high activity levels in 2023, FY23, which will contribute to expected continued growth. Our market capitalization is around the $50 million mark. Um, we have a very low EBIT DAX multiple. We have a very high EBIT DAX margin which we'll show you on our financials on the next page. So in FY22, we uh, recorded $44 million of revenue from oil and gas production, $16 million after tax profit, which is up 200%. Revenue was up 100%. And we have an EBIT DAX measure, which is up 180% to $29 million for the year. It's about a, over 60% EBIT DAX margin. Our production of oil and gas for FY 2022 was of over 600,000 barrels of oil equivalent, um, which is a mix of oil and gas. We have low cash costs, $23 a barrel of oil equivalent. 
which in last year's oil price environment led to a gross profit margin of $102 per barrel of oil we produced. Next, please. We produce oil and gas from four geographic regions and seven projects. In New Zealand, we have offshore oil production from the Mari Manaya fields, which have been in for uh, over, over 10 years since initial production. In Central Australia there, we acquired a project with three fields called Marini, Palm Valley and Dingo in late 2021. Uh, that was an acquisition that has contributed to our production during FY22. That's gas production onshore Australia, which is connected to both the Northern Territory and East Coast gas markets. In Indonesia, we have two projects. The Sampang PSC, and that stands for Production Sharing Contract, which is the, um, the license mechanism in Indonesia. We have an offshore field, which produces gas just off Madura Island that goes straight to power for East Java. Q owns 15% interest in that project. And our growth project is onshore oil production in the Mahato PSC in central Sumatra, up until the left there. So four different geographic areas, seven different projects, all contributing revenue, um, gives a very good risk tolerance for any changes in any one project. We have corporate offices in Melbourne as our head office, and we have an office in Jakarta staffed by Indonesians uh, who are good history in oil and gas who help us manage our production in, in Indonesia. Next, please. FY22 at $44 million revenue was um, double FY21 and our highest revenue from for at least over five years. We'll show in the coming slides that this was a result of both organic growth, reproduction in Indonesia onshore and acquisition of Central Australia assets. And we expect this to continue. Uh, we have near-term production growth through drilling in Indonesia. Uh, the Australian onshore projects we're running have only three quarters of revenue contributing to FY 2022 since the, the acquisition was in October 2021. So we've got another quarter of revenue there and growth through drilling in Indonesia. Bulk of the revenue that you can see there came from Indonesia during FY 22. Um, with contributions from Australia and New Zealand. Next, please. So we produced over 600,000 barrels of oil equivalent in FY 2022, 60% um, higher than FY 21. And by country, our most of our production came from Indonesia, 57%, um, Australia, 30%, and New Zealand, 13 with 60 5% of our production coming from gas. Now that's uh, in Australia, that was again only three quarters of the year where Australian assets are included. So that's expected to increase uh, by an extra quarter through FY23. And Indonesia production expected to increase as we move on and I'll show you the, the growth of our projects there. So this is our onshore Indonesian project in action. This is a Mahato PSC. And what we're seeing is onshore producing oil wells in the foreground and drilling in the background. Uh, this is our growth story, production and continued drilling. Next, please. So the Mahato PSC, which is onshore Indonesia and central Sumatra, contributed $15 million to our revenue in FY 2022. And what we're seeing in the the image there is a, a schematic of the field. The blue, uh, the blue line outlines the permit area and the green inside there outlines the expectation of the size of the field there. Uh, we put the field at 93 million barrels of oil in place and that would equate to approximately 21 million barrels of oil that are recoverable from the field um, at a gross level. The green dots represent the wells that have been drilled over the last 12 to 18 months and are producing five and a half thousand barrels of oil a day. And the real story for FY23 is the pink and red dots. These are the 10 wells that we'll be drilling at a rate of approximately one a month over the next 10 to 12 months. 
And if we continue to the next slide, please, it shows you how that translates into potential growth of production from the field. With the blue representing the, uh, the actual production up until July, and the gray representing the production from the field, which could be expected to double um, if the results were seen in the first two wells, which were drilled in June and July and achieved 1,000 barrels a day and 800 barrels a day. If they continue, we can expect that we would see a doubling of production from the field over the next year. So that's 10 more wells to be drilled, all production wells into a known oil producing field. The wells are approximately six to 7,000 feet. Uh, it takes a month from SPUD, the start of drilling, to connecting to the infrastructure we have in the field and selling the oil. So 10 wells, one a month for the next year. Next, please. Also in Indonesia, our, we have a gas project from Sampang Offshore, Sampang PSC. This is the, the gas plant, which is um, in part of Q's interest. And if we move through to the next slide, we can see the growth that's going to expect to come from this field. So at the moment in FY22, the Sampang PSC contributed $12 million in revenue. And this is from existing fields with fixed price gas contracts that go straight into power to power East Java. The growth here is through a new project, which we call Power Spiro, Blue Whale in Indonesian which was a gas discovery um, in 2018 that we expect to FID and develop um, at, towards the end of this year and, and develop moving into next year. That's expected to add 20 to 25 million cubic feet of day, a day of gas to the fuel production um, by 2025, which will translate directly into a new revenue source. So we're working on the, the FID at the moment, the feed's completed. There are some approvals from the government which are still pending and we'd expect to have the FID presented for approval before the end of the year. It's a very simple project. There'll be one well drilled into a gas discovered field. A wellhead platform, which you can see on the left of the screen there, will be built. A pipeline goes 27 kilometers under the, um, under the sea. And then, then it, all ex it, it all then connects into existing infrastructure which is the Oyong wellhead platform, which you can see in the photo, which is already there, and the gas processing plant, the bottom photo, which is also already there. So it's a very simple development, which when we get moving, we hope to move quickly on. Next, please. This is a photo of current drilling onshore Australia. That's in Palm Valley Field, which is just around the Alice Springs area, of course. Just around means a couple of hundred kilometers away in the, in this, in this sense, you can see the field there. Next, please. So these are our Q's onshore Australian assets, the Marini, Palm Valley and Dingo fields, which we acquired in October, 2021. The operator there is Central Petroleum, who's another ASX listed company. For the three quarters since the acquisition was completed, uh, Q recorded $8 million of revenue from these assets. Now, the oil and gas, it's predominantly gas comes from these fields, and we can see the pipeline infrastructure in the black lines that go that connects the fields through to the Australian East Coast. Um, there's some oil that comes out of Rooney Field, which also gets sold at, um, at, at market prices into South Australia. So anyone who looked at papers over the last few months, especially in the East Coast, would have seen the um, dramatic rise of spot gas prices and the continuing call on demand for gas into the East Coast market. We are connected into that East Coast market. And we just announced yesterday a contract for sale of gas to Shell Energy Australia into 2025. So what we're seeing is the demand for gas being high that companies will be locking in gas to 2025, two years away. There's growth in these fields that we expect to happen over the next 12 months. Um, we'll see that we are currently drilling in Palm Valley, um, which is currently happening. And we can expect to get some results there over the coming weeks as we get closer to the end of the drilling. 
In the marine field, which is existing gas production, we are also planning to go in back and look at six of the existing wells, undertake recompletions to make them more efficient and get more gas out of those. That's, that's a low cost way of, um, of, of making a, a well production more efficient from each well. We also expect that in FY23, there will be two new wells developed in and drilled in the marine field to deliver new gas and supply more gas into the East Coast market. The next slide, please. We will talk about the current drilling, which is a well that's called Palm Valley 12, PV12. It's currently drilling. Uh, it started in April 2022, and we're targeting an exploration uh, target um, deep in the image we see there. It's very challenging drilling conditions, um, resulting in announcements and decisions that we couldn't continue right to the bottom of the well. So we do it aside, a horizontal lateral, um, which also was not successful, and are now currently drilling a horizontal lateral well into the P1, which is a Pakuta reservoir, which is the gas production zone in the rest of the field. Next slide, please. Future revenue in New Zealand comes from the Mari field, and that gives us about $9 million last year. Next, we can see the Commitment to sustainability is on our website. We report under TCFD, uh, um, TCFD disclosures, and we have our climate change policy published. On the next slide, we'll see how that all translates into activities for the year. We've got 10 wells in the Mahato PSC in Indonesia, two wells being drilled in uh, onshore Australia in the Amadeus Basin, and some recompletions. These are all wells that are uh, due to be production wells. So on the next slide, to finalise the presentation here, YQ, we have a diversified production portfolio, Australia, Indonesia, and New Zealand. We have sustainable results from FY 2022. This is a new benchmark for the company, and it's the baseline going forward. The markets we sell into are oil and gas markets, which are all high demand and we're leveraged to oil, global oil prices. And in FY23, you can expect growth from production wells being drilled in Indonesia, 10 of those, and two wells plus recompletions of wells in onshore Australia at the Marini field. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, quite a few questions here. Now, that uh, gas supply agreement with Shell Energy, it talks about a fixed price, a take or pay contract. Can you uh, give us a little bit more understanding of what that means? Yeah, so the, the, the production, the, the, the contract was, we mentioned is due to start in 2025. Um, fixed price means that we've agreed on a price for that gas in that year. Um, and the take or pay concept of a gas supply agreement means that the, um, the buyer has um, agreed to take the gas and it's not flexible. There's some flexibility, but fundamentally they've either agreed to take the gas or pay for it. So it's a, from, a, from a seller's point of view, um, it, it's, a, it's a firm commitment to sell that gas for the year. And, and sorry, where is that price set then? Uh, the price is, it's a confidential price. We can't discuss gotcha. that. It's between you know, the buyer and the seller. Um, but as we mentioned in our announcements, we, you know, contracting this far out um, gives, gives the expectation there's a, there's a strong market for East Coast gas in the future. Understood. And, and your Indonesian oil and gas, does, where does that get exported to? So it all gets used uh, in Indonesia. The, right. the gas that we produce goes to straight into a power plant that powers East Java. Now that has some great sustainability um, benefits as the bulk of power that would otherwise be produced in Indonesia is from coal. So producing gas is environmentally um, friendlier than the alternate available in Indonesia. Uh, the oil also doesn't get exported. It gets used domestically and refined at a domestic refinery in Indonesia. So again, we're contributing to the growth of Indonesia through our energy um, we provide. And, and what about hedging? What role does that play? Uh, you know, for example, we've got a declining Australian dollar. Does that play into your hands? What, what role do you, do you play in, in fluctuations in your commodity base? Yeah, so we are, due to our um, diverse mix of, gas, long-term gas fixed price contracts in Indonesia and Australia. 
Um, and um, we don't hedge our oil. We, we, we take the market price, which has been very good last year and expected to continue. Um, we also sell 85% of our product in US dollars. So the current weakening Australian dollar uh, benefits us as we report in Australian dollars. Uh, also provides a natural hedge for our costs, which are either in, a, in US dollars to match the revenue or in New Zealand or Australian dollars, which gives us another benefit as the US dollar um, gains some strength. Um, Matthew, that's all we have time for. Um, it, it seems very cheap to me in a $16 million net profit market cap around $50 million. Good luck out there. Um, you've got some tailwinds. Um, have a nice weekend. Great. Thanks, Tim. Okay, uh, next up we have BPH Energy, ASX code uh, BPH, uh, market cap around $18 million. We have with us David Breeze, who is the executive director. The company is a diversified company holding investments in biotechnology and resources, including a significant interest in unlisted oil and gas exploration company, Advent Energy. David, nice to see you again. Over to you. Thank you. I'm going to speak uh, about... Uh, uh, Clean, clean hydrogen technologies, cortical dynamics, uh, advent energy. Um, and uh, I will briefly touch on the investments that advent energy has in uh, New Zealand, in uh, RL1 in the Northern Territory, uh, and uh, offshore uh, New South Wales. Uh, I will speak mainly during this presentation about offshore New South Wales. Uh, but I want to be able to touch on the uh, range of investments that uh, BPH has across those areas. Advent, of course, uh, has a retention license in RL1 in the Northern Territory. It's now in a position where it can evaluate uh, turning that into a production license. Um, it has the offshore uh, New South Wales, which you uh, likely to be well aware it was the subject of um, the issues to do with uh, the uh, presentation uh, or the uh, five um, matters to deal with the um, uh, the appointments of uh, Scott Morrison to ministries. And that's the subject now, the Bell Inquiry, which is the former High Court uh, Justice Bell and uh, that inquiry is now seeking submissions and uh, will uh, a report in the, at the end of November. It, there is, of course, a court action underway there uh, in the federal court, and I can't comment on the uh, process of that uh, federal court inquiry. Um, uh, sorry, of the federal court uh, matter. Uh, because of uh, each of those elements, except to say that the hearing is due in March of this year. Um, if we move to the next slide, please. So um, Australia is in the midst of an energy supply crisis and uh, those elements are known. It's part of what is uh, currently a, a global uh, energy supply uh, crisis. Uh, the reason that um, I bring this slide in here is because it was predicted by many over an extended period of time that there was insufficient investment into energy, including in Australia and including in the gas market. And that's now been at very substantially demonstrated by the uh, gas going to $40 a gigajoule in Australia. But in addition, of course, uh, the Australian government regulatory authorities had to direct the seizure or enable the seizure of the uh, electricity supply generation and the gas um, generation and production processes uh, in June and July during this most recent crisis. Now, there is further predictions by AEMO of uh, issues to do with uh, potential instabilities in supply in the electricity market, which uh, is uh, likely to occur in South Australia as early as next year and in New South Wales during 24-25. The cost to the Australian uh, consumer uh, of the uh, last element was $1.8 That is dwarfed by what has just occurred 
in the UK where there was uh, civil insurrection and uh, parties refusing to pay their uh, bills. And Liz Truss, the new Prime Minister of the UK, has just committed in the reported sense to $100 billion of uh, energy uh, substitution in, uh, oh, sorry, of energy uh, price support in the marketplace in, in the uh, UK. That's $100 billion to pay out in order to just keep the price for energy consumers at about $4,000 a household, and it was supposed to go to $10,000 per household per year. Extraordinary elements going on here in the international marketplace. So the Resources Minister, Madeleine King, has uh, now said that there should be a freeing up of uh, gas reserves in the Australian marketplace, and I'll talk more on that in a moment. Next slide, please. So um, the PEP11 project, uh, 30 kilometres uh, south-southwest of uh, Newcastle uh, and about 26 kilometres out to sea, has the potential to uh, uh, contribute to and perhaps um, address those forecast gas shortages in the uh, East Australian market. In addition, of course, it's a recognised area for potential future carbon storage. That is the area of the PEP11 project. And uh, there are 300,000 jobs that rely on gas supply in uh, New South Wales. So this is a really a significant issue and uh, potential alternate supply is uh, critically important. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this slide addresses uh, our investment in uh, clean hydrogen technologies. Um, essentially, the main reason that we've invested into clean hydrogen technologies, that is BPH and uh, Advent have taken between them 10% of this company, is demonstrated quite uh, clearly in this slide. The uh, potential for... Uh, clean hydrogen is to produce hydrogen at uh, around $2 a kilogram versus uh, electrolysis, which is uh, between $7 to $11 a kilogram. Of course, uh, the other element of that is um, that it produces that with no CO2 emissions, and I'm going to cover that off in the next slide, please. If we can move there. So uh, the investment in clean hydrogen is uh, a technology that was uh, uh, proved 10 years ago. It was a success in that it produced uh, hydrogen from waste heat gases. And uh, it was supposed to also simultaneously produce high quality carbon nanotubes. It failed in the objective of the high quality carbon nanotubes for the entirety of its production. It produced those, but here we have an example of, of a product that didn't work in the way that people wanted it to work at the time, because what it showed was that it could produce uh, um, it could produce hydrogen and it could also simultaneously produce carbon black. And now, of course, 10 years on, we have the position where people around the world are looking for hydrogen technology, hydrogen production technologies that uh, are capable of um, meeting the requirements of the energy substitution in the uh, uh, area that we're going to towards uh, net zero 2050. And uh, that was the real reason why we went into this uh, technology. Next slide, please. Uh, so cortical dynamics is our other investment. We have 17%. They're, in this year, they're making substantial gains under the uh, new CEO. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, Zimple 
there has really made significant gains in the way in which the technology is being developed and the parties with whom the company is in being involved with. The technical part is there, AIT in uh, Vienna on uh, artifact removal and signal enhancement and uh, Lorgan uh, for uh, AI uh, development. And we of course have been working with Philips on a plug and play uh, agreement in place for the Balm Dam and that is uh, ongoing. We'll report more on that, uh, we believe in the near future. The anesthesia monitoring is a, a better anesthesia monitoring device is looked for by anesthetists and surgeons and hospitals all around the world in order to reduce risk, reduce costs. And uh, it's a billion dollar marketplace. We're well placed in that and we're attracting significant international interest. Next slide, please. So I spoke uh, briefly about uh, New South Wales and uh, the uh, energy market. And of course, you've seen that and heard what occurred during the time frame. The Resources Minister and the Prime Minister have both guaranteed to our trading partners, in particular to Japan and Korea, that LNG will continue to be supplied from them from the sources within Australia. And of course, that's the element that uh, the, the of uh, supply constraints in a global positioning and an Australian positioning where Victoria is due to, the offshore fields in Victoria are due to uh, reduce by around 43%. Now, here, these couple of characteristics show just how crucial this um, supply issue is. UK has just taken an LNG shipment out of Australia. In other words, from the other side of the world. There are 25 new LNG FSRU import facilities being constructed, built or designed in Europe at the moment as a result of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. The European community now accepts gas and looks to gas as a baseload power substitute and, um, and sees that occurring for the uh, long term from here. In other words, gas in the global context is critically important. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, I'll, I use this slide, it actually comes from um, the slide in the first instance comes from the uh, Energy Quest. Whilst this slide is a year old, this is to demonstrate that a year ago, uh, the, gas for, the gas shortfall was forecast to occur out into 24-25. It didn't, it occurred in this last year. Um, and of course, the, there is now further predictions of electricity instability by AEMO going through into South Australia in 23 and New South Wales as early as 24, 25, as I outlined earlier. So additional gas supply into that marketplace is crucial. If we can move to the next slide, please. So um, I've spoken largely about these elements uh, and uh, we're, we are really seeing now a forecast for further shortages of energy and gas in the uh, Northern Hemisphere during the coming winter. We have seen in California just this last two weeks, California asking people not to charge their uh, electric powered cars and for uh, people to be asked to restrain their use of electricity. The same thing occurred in, uh, in Europe in the uh, recent past and we really need more gas brought into the global supply network. Next slide, please. So I come to the PEP 11 permit. 
4,700 kilometres on the doorstep of uh, Sydney. It's being uh, recognised as a um, proven petroleum basin and uh, two new gas-fired power stations for a New South Wales firming generation are currently being built. Um, our um, investments there, either through the uh, supply of methane into the uh, Newcastle pipeline or by way of uh, hydrogen conversion subject to the successful uh, development of the investment that we have in the hot, clean hydrogen, both can contribute to the requirement for net zero. Next slide, please. And I won't dwell on these ones, except to say, make a couple of points on each element. The offshore area is recognised as being in the gas window and uh, as being able to potentially provide a viable, mature gas condensate source along the offshore uplift, which is where our permit is. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, we have a, um, a 20 square kilometre area uh, of uh, drilling targets subject, of course, to uh, all of those relevant approvals and the successful outcome of the um, uh, federal court challenge. Next slide, please. Um, these demonstrate that in the area at 2,000 metre subsurface, that the CSIRO Petroleum Research Division had uh, demonstrated a significant potential um, attributes from the seismic of uh, bright spot um, uh, reflection strength uh, instantaneous frequency. In other words, both direct and indirect indications of hydrocarbon, and that is gas where we're uh, looking to drill. Next slide, please. Um, and if you just keep on clicking through this slide, what this shows is the work that was done by Geoscience Australia and others during 2006 in uh, looking at the seafloor and gas escape features uh, in the seafloor offshore uh, New South Wales during that survey. And there was a further recent one um, just in the last several months, and there'll be reports out on that further as well. Next slide, please. Um, the reason that this is here is that this sort of uh, gas seepage occurs all around the world and it occurs both onshore and offshore. The uh, point is here that in areas where uh, geochemical sampling shows that you have hydrocarbons, the technical success rate of wells drilled right around the world uh, was 85%. And of course, we've reported previously on the uh, geochemical sampling that shows and confirms the attributes that I've uh, just talked about a moment ago. I should stop at that point and um, uh, just go through to the next slide, which is, has our, um, our disclaimer. And thank you. Uh, so uh, if we can move uh, to questions. Yeah, sure, David. Hey, um, now our ex-Prime Minister wore many hats uh, as he uh, walked away, including Resource Minister. Why, why did he focus on, on your project in particular? Uh, I'll only talk to certain elements of your question. Um, okay. There was an excellent article uh, by Karen Middleton in the Saturday paper on the uh, 27th of last month. And uh, that set out a, a very detailed analysis, in, including uh, independent um, uh, specialists in administrative and uh, constitutional law. And uh, the, that newspaper article, as did the extensive other uh, press reporting, make one point only. The only decision that Morrison made uh, during the entirety of the uh, five additional secret portfolios that he held was to uh, prevent uh, Keith Pitt from approving the PEP 11 permit extension. Okay, so not no more details than that, I understand. Um, 
So this asset, PEP11, has been around a long time from, from my understanding. It goes back some time into the 80s, I believe. There's a lot of, uh, you've got to drill it depth. What, what, what makes you believe you can get this off the ground? Um, the change in circumstances that I've outlined in this presentation really show that Australia is short gas. Offshore Victoria being uh, reducing in its capacity to deliver into the marketplace, where in fact, uh, AEMO has said that we need an extra 45 gigawatts of power generation, and there is 15 gigawatts of power generation going to go out of the system, and you need, and that's recognised both within Australia and across the world, that you need firming capacity to back up solar and wind. And we don't yet have the capacity, and we, on uh, uh, government figures, we have to... Um, spend about $30 billion on just the power connectivity and infrastructure. And uh, so in fact, gas is a really important facet of baseload power back up to renewables. I mean, there are some incredible tailwinds behind um, your asset here, but it will take some time. I mean, there's there's a lot of headwinds you, you have to face before you can get that to market. I mean, what sort of timeframes are we talking about? Um, I, I won't talk to those timelines precisely. I will talk to um, uh, market specifics. When Cooper installed their pipeline from a, a, a gas production area, which is about 26 kilometres offshore, into the new gas production facility that they were uh, um, putting that, uh, that pipeline into. They installed that pipeline in under uh, six months. The, when you have a real need and a recognized support from government, uh, that's why I use this um, uh, aspect of 25 new LNG import facilities, five of which are going to occur in Europe this year. That's new facilities. When the need is there and government recognises and supports that need, then you are able to achieve things in a very rapid time frame. I mean, with respect, David, we are talking about an asset that's 30 kilometres off the coast of Newcastle, though. It, it, it would be a long lead time. Um, we haven't produced a, a determination on that. I, again, I take you back to the Cooper uh, period of, uh, of uh, permitting and uh, installation. It's less than uh, six months to put a pipeline in. Okay. Um, and just, just finally, um, BPH Energy looks like it's got a lot, lot of optionality in um, you know, new the, part of this kind of energy transition, gas and also hydrogen. Why, why the biotech aspects of the business? I mean, it, it just seems non-core to what your focus is. Um, we actually initiated the company that is BPH Energy as a biotech investment entity. The market conditions at the time um, were more conducive to. Uh, making additional investments into energy, and that's exactly what we did. However, we made uh, four investments into uh, medtech at the time. In the sense of uh, success rates on, on a, an international or Australian basis, we have one project that is now just made application for FDA approval, that's the cortical project. So having one out of four projects that are moving forward into um, the potential for commercialisation is a, um, an outstanding outcome on a relative basis. So we're not making more investments in that space, but we are and have been supporting uh, our um, lead investments in that space. Great, David. That's all we have time for. Thank you for your time. Have a nice weekend. Thank you indeed. Thanks for the time. That's all we have time for, everyone. We're not back next week. Enjoy your long weekend. Uh, we'll see you the following week.